you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Today's guest is John Toomey. John's a four-star eventing rider, trainer and coach. He's also successfully competed up to advanced dressage. He's a winning show jumping rider and now he's a popular show jumping and eventer, trainer and coach. How are you, John? I'm well, Glennis, really well. Thank you. <laughs> John, I'm sure you've got a favourite quote for us today to um, talk to our listeners. Oh, gosh, you know, I actually love quotes. So I've probably got a couple that I'd throw at you, but my yep. favourite one is from a guy called Peter Bergman who said, when you're not practising, remember, somewhere, someone is practising and when you meet them, he will win. And that's driven me and got me out of bed for years and years, really, just the thought that if I might not be up and doing the job, that somebody's going to beat me on the weekend. But, you know, the other one is from a gal called uh, Leanne Carters and she said, continuous effort, not strength or intelligence, is the key to unlocking our potential. And really, I think in our sport especially, I, I, I know I'm not really familiar with any other sports, but certainly perpetual and continuous effort seems to be a key to my success. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I talk to a lot of people and ask them about the keys to working in the industry and they say, you know, it's continuous effort, persistence, just keep coming back, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And, yeah. um, you know, people that, and you would have seen it, people that aren't as talented as riders that keep coming back and are persistent, they're the ones that keep getting up there. Yep. Absolutely. And that really is the key because, you know, I think it's been a proven scientific fact that talent is not the key to success. Yes, Yes, it may be an early indicator, but if it's not coupled with the persistence and the continuous effort, then it's just nothing. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, John, tell me about when you started with horses. You know, I mean, you, you grew up in Narangbar. I know that you lived on acreage a bit later on, but did you always live on acreage? Were your parents horsey? Can you tell our listeners a bit about that? Absolutely. That's a terrifying thing that only as a three-year-old I couldn't have cared about. It. But and like my dad had been a policeman. Yep. Mum was back then and always just a housewife. She, she, I'm the eldest of nine children. Mm. And we moved from the city, from Brisbane City to the farm when I was three, and Dad decided immediately that we should all be right. When I say all, there was only two, <laughs> two children then, but yep. we should be riding. So my earliest memories are of a, a very naughty Shetland pony, and I do have reel-to-reel -reel movies to remind me of the raucous time that I used to have, but I used to always joke that I could remember that I was riding better by how far I had to walk home every time it <laughs> took off and bucked me off because we had no fences on the farm. We only had a 20-acre farm, but we boarded thousands of acres of forestry, uh, mm -hmm. pine forestry, and this bloody thing would tolerate me for just so long and then it would just run off into the bush until it managed to get rid of me. So. The further I had to walk home, the more I felt I was progressing. But yes, my earliest memories are, if you can believe, mustering on that bloody Shetland pony. I could barely steer it. <laughs> and by the time I was four, I was the front page of the Caboolture newspaper for being the youngest unassisted rider at the Caboolture Gymkhana. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, just out of interest, if someone that you met said to you, oh, I'm moving on to acreage and I've got a three-year-old and I think I'll buy him a pony. What sort of advice would you give them? I'd recommend they get them ballet shoes or a tennis racket. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> because, you know, look, back then none of us even had helmets, for heaven's sake. It's a yes. wonder any of us survived. Yep, yep. But now as a coach, mm. and I don't, I'm a level two eventing specialist coach, but I teach kids that can't rise to the trot, providing they want to make progress and they're yes. interested in learning the craft. That's, yeah. I'm really interested in the young riders because their minds are open and then not got preconceived ideas. But mm. at the same time, I see a whole bunch of parents who know nothing about what they're going into mm -hmm. that are trying to impinge on the child with knowledge that they don't even have. So it's um, any of those kids that survive a situation like mine are definitely meant to be riding. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, and it's a shame that three-year-olds may be put off, though, you know, if they get yes, into a situation definitely. where they do get a cranky pony that does put them on the ground fairly often, you know, like so, I had a so pony once. Grow up together. Yeah, yes, yes, 
Yeah. Yeah. Now, what about working with horses? You know, having a career in the horse industry, we talked a little bit before about the persistence, but what are the core skills or um, character types that you think do well in the horse industry? Well, you know, and it's like I was saying before, at the age of 50, I've had a lot of time to reflect back on things mm. like that. And I've seen a lot of kids come and go from the sport who appeared to have a whole bunch of talent and, and were out on a trajectory to the highest levels. Mm-hmm. But I really think it comes down to, at the core, the catalyst of it all has to be that you really, really just love horses. Mm-hmm. I mean, I used to get up at 3.30 in the morning when I was a kid on school holidays or weekends, and I would catch my pony at, in the dark at 3.30 and canter three and a half kilometres on a barefoot pony to a racing stable and have half the boxes mucked out before the boss even got out of bed. Mm, and I mm. wasn't even getting paid. Yep. So yep. he used to let me ride a few, you know, like that was once I, I was 12 when I started with him. Mm-hmm. And as I progressed and earned his trust and he thought I had some skills and he started putting me on a few and we were mostly breaking into the racetrack and doing their initial barrier trial at Deegan before they went off to city trainers. Mm-hmm. But I just did that because there's nothing I could wait to do more than that on my weekends and school holidays. Get up at 3.30 in the morning and canter down the side of the road <laughs> on bareback, mind you, mm. and go and shovel shit at the local stables. Yep. And I think the kids that stay in this sport, even, you know, I'd sit around and talk to some of the guys in my group, you know, like Chuggy and those different guys, actually, they really still admire their horses. Mm. They've got a very fine-tuned skill set that's more because they've got an empathetic way of dealing and communicating with their horses. So I think the catalyst has to be that you really, really love the subject because as one of my other favourite quotes, and I apply it to mostly to eventing, is that eventing is an island of success set in a sea of disappointment. <laughs> and anyone who's been trying to progress in the sport of eventing with injuries and things like that knows that you can think you're on a winning trajectory and then next thing you're on a 12-month tendon rehab. Yep. And outside a selection framework, all of a sudden you can think you're on your way to the next Olympics and next thing you're walking up the road on the bitumen in straight lines for months. Yes. So if you don't really, really engage and love what you do, why could you be bothered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I can understand that. And it's what I love about it at 50. I actually really, really look forward to it every day still. (laughs) (laughs) It's good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, now what about people who've influenced you? Oh, I've had some really good ones, but, you know, ever since I was a little boy, even though he was a Kiwi, I have always been the biggest fan of Mark Todd's. Okay. And it's quite hilarious. Like, I grew up in Australia, and I hadn't ridden for over a decade when I moved to New Zealand and I moved to Cambridge, all places, just mm-hmm. because it was central over there. And I remember being down at the service station filling up one day and looking across at the next Bowser and it's like, oh my God, that's Mark Todd. <laughs> when I went back to the yard, I said to my wife, I said, oh my God, you'll never guess who is the next Bowser. Mark Todd. She said, oh wow, that's fabulous. Did you go and say hi? I said, dear God, no. I said, I couldn't, I couldn't go and say hello to Mark. And then we went to another friend's 50th birthday and who should turn up because Joe rode at the first world in 78. Yep. Joey and Bridgman and her yep. and Mark are good friends. So Mark came to the party and when I got introduced to him, I actually couldn't speak. Is that funny? And you probably yeah. know me long enough to know I'm never short of a word. Sure. But he, I always like to watch successful riders or another rider that I'd like to ride like. Yes. And then I go, I'm just going to do it like that. I'm not uh-huh. interested in, in listening to the theory or reading all the long pages and stuff. I just turn on the video, watch somebody, Andrew Hoy is another beautiful writer, and Stuart Tinney, and I just watch those real tacticians and then I go, I'm going to do it like that. But mm. early in my piece with writing, I think when I was maybe 17 or 18, I met Sandra Pearson Adams mm-hmm. up in Queensland. She was a huge influence. In fact, she was the first one that really took me under her wing and gave me my first taste of formal coaching. Mm-hmm. And to this day, I still will call in and see Spa when I'm going through Northern Rivers. Mm. I actually did last and last the last week, and so I popped in. It's, it's, oh, a, it's a, well, I was going from Canberra to you know North Coast, so she's a handy spot on the way. But I wanted to catch up with her about a few things as well. So yeah. Oh, I just yeah. love it a bit, and you know, she's I, great. I look at her, yeah. and I don't know, she must be around eighty now, and still riding, and I just go, oh, she's so, she so inspires me. 
Mm, mm, mm. No, she's good. And she's been a previous guest and there's lots of other people that she's inspired as well, you know, so it's it's good. Yeah. 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 Okay, what about horses? Oh, I, you know, when you get a really special one, it makes a lot of the ones you thought were special look a bit average. <laughs> what was your and, first special um, I, one? Oh, Lord. Well, the first special one was a horse called Soundtrack. Mm-hmm. And actually, Sandra found that horse for me. Yep. It was back in the late 80s. And, you know, I was trying to fund my riding myself. I'm the oldest of nine kids off a chicken farm. So, yeah. mum and dad never actually, apart from buying us a few wild ponies when we were little kids, mm. that's as far as the financial support went. And I was kind of struggling. I'd had a one star horse that had come up and done really well that I got offered good money for and sold and Sandra said look you need something better and there was uh, this, this horse up there that had been out I think in the paddock for six years the girl had got a pilot's license commercial pilot's license and went to work and they wanted to sell it and Spa said look you need to get it back out there to re-establish his value mm. so after six years in the paddock I got him and pretty much in the first 12 months he was uh, an intermediate horse then or two star in today's terms and I took him advanced or three star in, in today's terms. And in our first year, we won the equitation championship at the Queensland Indoor Show Jumping Championships. And we won the three star at the two day event championships back in the day. They ran it at Victory Pocket mm. in two days with a long format road and tracks and steeplechase. Yep. So I won the three star there and I also captained the Witty Queensland team that year. So he was the first real dude that I ever had. And looking back with how limited I was in my skill set then, it made him even more special because he really did count me around some big track. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Has that been – because you'd said about he was your first special horse. What other ones have you got? Oh, you know, the one that really stands out was a horse I bought in New Zealand mm. and it was bred by a student of ours over there, Sarah Mellon from Montrose Park. And she's had a lot of super horses come out of a mare line that she had. The cat started at Mamaku, where, um, gosh, what was Toddy's little horse called? Charisma came from. Charisma. And yeah. Yeah, it was a Mamaku horse. Mm. And so Sarah had this horse that she was trying to produce herself. And he was over 17 hands. He was by a brilliant invader out of a distal fink mare called Diversity. Now, distal fink was a German import to New Zealand, left a lot of good show jumpers. But they were really sharp and difficult. And then, of course, with that brilliant invader over the top, he was quite a handful. So when he was four, she was coming for lessons and really, really struggling with him. Mm -hmm. And I used to ride him a bit before she'd have a lesson with my wife, Caroline. And in the end, she said, look, I usually sell these horses for quite a bit of money overseas. But she said, if you think you can ride him, Mm. I'll give you an entire season to see if you think you can get a tune out of him. And we agreed on a price of $50,000, which was, I couldn't imagine where I was going to find that at the time. Mm-hmm. But I jumped at the opportunity. And as a five-year-old in our first year, oh no, so, sorry, he won the National Young Event Horse over there, which is a, quite a prestigious class at the National Three-Day Event in Taupo with Sarah on board. And then I stepped on and our first year, we won the National One and Three-Day Event Championships at one star level. Mm-hmm. As a six-year-old, as a seven-year-old, he won the one- and three-day event national titles at two-star level. Mm. And then at seven, that was at seven, and then he did a tendon before his first three-star then. But I'll ne- I'll be, I'd probably be lucky if I ever find another horse that jumped like him. He was just a freak of nature, and I, all my show jumping friends used to lament that he was wasted mm. eventing, but he was brave to a fault. His mm-hmm. only weakness was... He had no submission, really. And uh, Leonie Bramal, who used to help us down there a lot, she said, the horse is attached, but will never be connected. So we did okay on the flat, but we did struggle with the dressage phase. It was a bit like having a triathlete with a weak swing mm-hmm. leg. Mm-hmm. But he would always finish on his dressage score. And we brought him back here in 2011. 2012 was our best year. We won the three-star at Sydney Eventing, Canberra CIC three-star, Talpo CIC three-star. We were second at the last selection trial at Equestria for London. We got beat by 0.4, but was the only horse out of 32 to finish on his dressage score at that event. Mm, mm. And unfortunately had a catastrophic failure in a foot. A real freak thing happened in February this year, and I had to put him down unexpectedly. Mm-hmm. But that there was my lifetime unicorn. And 
I think about him often and smile, you know, and that's the cool thing about him. Was that your biggest challenge when you put him down or is there something else that you want to talk about? Oh, Lord. I, You know, I struggle parting with any of my animals, my dogs and my horses, but putting that horse down, because it was such a shock, like I'm normally, I was at the point, he was turning 18 this year mm-hmm. and I have a marvellous vet, Rachel Sal from Randwick in Sydney, mm-hmm. and she's probably one of the few vets I've had that I've I've always felt like she treated my horse like it was hers. Yep. And she really loves the high performance space. And I kept saying to her, Rachel, you have to tell me when it's time for me to ease this horse out of the elite level of mm-hmm. eventing because yep. he's he's so tough. He's so strong and bloody minded. He's the horse that will die on a cross country track trying to his end, you know. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want that. I wanted him to really go somewhere where he's going to go jumping meet a show jumping traps with a sweet girl who was just going to love him and cuddle him every day because you retire those horses out in the field and they just turn into old men overnight, you know. Mm, mm. So, and Rachel had said to me, because we worked him up several times a year and I had a huge history of x-rays and images and MRIs and different things to make sure we stayed on top of things. And she said to me at the end of last year, she said, look, John, there's no clinical reason why you should even be thinking about retiring this horse. He's actually sounder than when you brought him in from New Zealand back in 2011. Mm -hmm. So I was on the plate that day when we x-rayed him. And when I stood up and turned around, we were it was a small laminitic event Mm -hmm. that just went terminal in a week. Literally, in the 10 days between x-rays, his pedal bone was pristine. The rotation was improving. He had more soul three weeks in to the event. Everyone was thrilled. And Mm. literally 10 days later, his pedal bone was looked like Swiss cheese. His deep digital Uh flexor tendon had let go. And he'd rotated 37% in 10 days. Wow. So... I was on the plate and I turned around, looked at the screen, just crumpled down in a heap because I knew that was Mm, it, you know. So mm. to have something like that and then have it taken away from you an hour later was nothing I really prepared for. And I think that's probably the toughest thing I've ever done in 46 years around horses. Mm, mm. Yeah, it certainly is tough. But I'm not Robinson Crusoe, you know. There's Oh, for sure. There's a whole bunch of us have to front up to that one. And I tell people when I talk about it, it's the cost of entry into the place that we go, you know. And I always say I would never swap a minute of the pain that I had to experience saying goodbye to that horse for any of the joy that he bought me in all those years. It was just remarkable. Is that where you – because you'd said earlier, what would you say, eventing's an island of successful – what is it, eventing in an yeah, island of island success? Of success. Set yeah. in a sea of disappointment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose you've just explained that as well, haven't you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Now, put on your training cap and, you know, yeah. you're out at a lot of events, a lot of competitions, but you also yeah. see horses at home as well. What's a common yeah. problem that you think, you know, because oh, I want the solution as well, a common problem that, you know, because our listeners, they, they want to listen, they want to learn something that one of them or a few of them might have that you can also yep. help them with? Oh, Lord, I probably, I'm probably, unfortunately, probably would talk more in generalities. And mm-hmm. I just find, you know, this is a huge subject. It's like a martial art. And had I really thought about it when I was a teenager, like I was trying to get my black belt, I'm sure I would, would have become a better rider a lot quicker because I would have realized the amount of learning that was in front of me. And I probably would have set out more anxiously to find that knowledge instead of letting it kind of find me as I stumbled through the subject. Yeah. So, you know, the first thing that I did that was a successful action was when I ran into Sandra and I found a good coach that I aligned with and got on really well with who helped start to guide me through the many pitfalls. And more so today, I think, and it might just be, everyone might think, oh, he sounds like an old fella now, but... More so now today, people, if they've got money, just want to buy a horse that could go out and win and take them up the grades really quickly. And if nothing else I've found in our sport, no matter which of the disciplines that you compete in, water finds its level very quickly. And the best advice I've got to people is to actually focus on developing their own skill set. And the thing that I hate the most is people trying to cut corners or rush through steps that they should be taking time on even if it's just pushing up the grade i mean a lot of dressage clients they just can't wait to get to medium and actually medium's a graveyard because too many of them miss too many of the steps on the way to medium 
too many of the basics and the foundational building blocks. And when they get to medium, the horse is, it actually can't perform those high level movements because you haven't built a body suitable to do so. Mm-hmm. So I think taking the time and listening to your horse and not just his behavior, but his body, if he's really tired one day, you don't have to ride him solid for an hour. You know, you've got to listen to where your horse's mind and his body is at in order to manage a horse that's going to last. Like HR was about to turn 17, and unfortunately that took him out of the frame, that little lemonitic event. But otherwise, he was actually sounder than he had been five years earlier mm-hmm. because I'd learned through owning a horse like that to be very good at managing him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's a very general answer to your question, but I would say don't try and skip steps. Take the time. Time is your friend in this business. And to the point where I've got to the point where, you know, one of my biggest frustrations in the business of equestrian is that for a long time, for many years, I was caught up with, you know, I ran two professional grooms. I had a horse walker. They'd come out of their box, get their gear on, go to the horse walker for 10 minutes. They'd lead them down to the arena. I'd literally get off one and onto the other, sometimes from one back to the other mm. on the quiet ones. Mm. And then I'd ride that next one for 40 minutes while that one went to the walker for 10 minutes and then got mm. hosed and put away. It was just, and unfortunately, we get in this trap where we have to produce a certain amount of money because God yep. knows. I, mm. I budget $50,000 a year to run a three slash four star horse. Mm-hmm. That's not me making any money. That's just being in Sydney with vets and travel yep. all over the country. And so you need a great deal of money to make that work. So I did for a long time get trapped in the commercial aspect of it. And I'm happy to say that I've kind of made it to the place where I can get on a horse without looking at my watch, especially the youngsters and just give them the time they need. And when they're finished in the arena, if I'm really happy, I take them up the road for 15 minutes just to chill out and have a hack. Mm. And Mm. I I couldn't do that before. My head was too flustered with having to make enough bucks to buy that next horse or get the truck on the road for the next weekend. Or So that's tough. That's tough because a lot of us, you know, we we need the money, but it's all about balance, I think. Oh, hang on a sec. Let me interrupt to let people know about the horse industry qualifications at onlinehorsecollege.com. If you have a look at the flexible options, there's online theory with practical components that can be completed by video or with a qualified expert in your area. That website again is onlinehorsecollege.com. Thanks. I think often, you know, in a business, you talk about scaling a business, you talk about production line, you talk about leverage, you talk about using your skills, you know, so that you're just using the skills in the work that you're doing. But then it's, you're right, because it's not just the skills riding that your horse needs. Your horse needs the time that you spend with it so you can get the most out of it. Yeah. Mm. And and I see a lot more when I look at my horse's legs than most of the teenage grooms that I hire. Mm, mm, mm. So little right. things like, you know, getting on a horse where I, I had a, way back then I had a, he was a good show groom. He'd worked in some big show yards, but we went show jumping one weekend and he put a boot on a tendon that was bowed and mm. I went and jumped a class on a oh, bowed no. tendon. Oh no. Yeah. So that was yeah. a really tough lesson. And the horse mm. wasn't lame. Except mm. I came back to the truck and I took the boots off to hose him because he was out leading something else around. Yep. I like that bloody horse has got a boat tendon. Mm. So, you know, it's little lessons like that where I've gone, actually, I just need to see everything's legs before the boots go on. And yeah. I just find it goes better if I've got fewer horses and I'm spending more time in the management of them, not just the riding of them. Yes, yes. Yep, that makes sense. John, have you got a book that you can recommend, one that's inspired you, one that you use, one that you'd recommend to your students? Oh, I love books. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm old school, you know. I like to, I like to stand <laughs> the page. Yep. Do you fold over the corners if you've got a, a you know, like you were always told not to do? You fold over the corners if there's something, or do you use a bookmark if there's something you want to come back yeah, to? Yeah, I hate, I hate folded corners. So I've you got, like I've bookmarks? Got, I've got highlighters, yellow okay. highlighters, yep. all over the place, mm-hmm. and every bag that I've got. And but you know, I I like to model myself on writers that I admire, and I always was a massive fan of Rainer Klimka. Mm-hmm. And of course, I think Ingrid has done an amazing job of following in her father's footsteps yep. as a horsewoman. So, you know, I've got a number of the books that she's stepped in and they've upgraded since he's gone. But I think for most of the listeners, the one that I would pick would be Basic Training of the Young Horse. 
because okay. that's where everyone tends to rush when they're babies. You know, got to get to one star, got to get to medium, whatever it is. And I think that the basics, and I always describe it as three basic steps, like your pre-flight check sheet. You need a horse whose propulsion system is within himself. He's in front of your leg, if you will, and he's taking you. And Because I see people turn up all the time, they have to kick their horse every step just to make it around the arena. Mm. So they've got to be self-propelled and in front of the leg. Then you've got to get lateral balance, which is your straightness and steering, so that if you thought you had a set of kitchen scales in both reins, you want to be able to make both reins weigh the same. And then once you've got him in front of the leg and he's straight, then you can start to work on expanding and contracting the paces, making transitions between the paces, building into transitions within the pace. And that builds engagement. Mm -hmm. And that, everyone thinks that sounds really simple, but actually there's not many people can get on their horse and actually pull that off. Mm. So that would be my first pick, basic training of a young horse. And then a little bit out because I also believe in developing yourself – and one of my favorite books is a very simple book with a very simple message called The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. And the basic message is, is that nothing happens overnight. It doesn't matter if you think, oh, God, I'm fat. Well, it's not because you had McDonald's yesterday. It's because you've had McDonald's every day for the last 10 years. And the differences that we make is by creating habits that are daily. Mm. It's the slight edge. It's just making a little difference every day gets you a long way. <laughs> and it's the last 2% in elite sport that makes all the difference. And that book helped me a lot. Good, good. Okay. Now, can you, uh, what does your future hold? What are you looking forward to? What have you got? Some young horses coming on, riders, events? What have you got coming up? Oh, Lord Glennis. <laughs> you know, like the last two and a half years for me has been quite a reset. Caroline and I separated two and a half years ago, and mm -hmm. the divorce came through early this year. And flaunted, which was my other good four-star horse. Yep. We had a bad accident in 2011. He retired from eventing the next year. He's working young rider with a lovely kid doing straight dressage. Yep. HR was put down. When we consolidated for the divorce, most of the young horses went. Mm -hmm. And I really don't have an eventer for the first time in a very long time. I've sat on a bunch of, or I've kissed a lot of frogs. I've not really found my next prince, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I've got a beautiful young dressage horse, a four-year-old with an owner. And we're planning, I don't love the young horse space because I think it pushed too fast, but I'm going to make sure he doesn't do too much work, but he'll do dressage with the stars and Sydney CDI early next year. And yeah, we'll see. I've got I've got a four year old coming that's definitely aimed at eventing mm -hmm. from a lovely friend of mine up in Newcastle, Susie Steggles, who's got some beautiful young horses that she's bred. So yeah, I've done full circle. I'm back on two four year olds at the moment, and <laughs> I'm just waiting to see. I'm talking to some possible owners to go and find a two or three star horse at this stage to get me back in the top of the sport next year. That would mm. be the plan. Good, good. <laughs> Okay, John, you've talked a lot, you know, about your philosophy during the interview. Can you sum it up just into, you know, just shortly, just sum it up and uh, make it into a lesson so that our listeners got something they can sort of go away and think about for the rest of the day? Yeah, I think one of the – and I've always been a bit of an overachiever. Mm -hmm. Like if I see something, I'll just gallop towards it and I've always kind of rushed through life trying to get to that next pinnacle that I'm aiming for. So especially in the horse space, I, my, I think my best advice I can give anyone is just to take the time and to listen to your horse. Like most people treat their horse like it's a motorbike. Yep. And it's there as a commodity to get them to the next event, win the next ribbon. And it took a very long time for me to realize that it was actually more about the journey than it was about the destination. And that was quite a, a flip over for me because I'm very, very competitive, but I'm still competitive, but I listen to my horse. And when you listen, they'll tell you things. They can't talk, but they will tell you. And because I train a lot of problem horses with behavioral issues, one of the things I realized years ago is actually it's not behavioral problems at all. There's either a pain reaction in the horse. They've either got it in a dreadful saddle that doesn't fit or, you know, there's some bit of tack on the horse that's causing a lot of discomfort mm -hmm. or they've just started to make it crazy mm. and probably their husband or wife with them you know mm. <laughs> so if <laughs> and all i do is take these horses i will not take anything under six weeks 
Mm-hmm. Because within two weeks, usually, I've worked out if there's a pain problem or it's a behavioral issue because they've got a valid problem that they're trying to communicate to the rider and the rider just keeps spurring them or whipping them, you know? Mm. So they feel invalidated and they just go get stuffed and buck them off. So yep. I don't find many badly behaved horses that have behavioral problems. So I just tell people, you need to listen to your horse. You need to tick all the boxes. I mean, when they arrive, I look at ulcers. I look at their mouth and see how their teeth are going and how they're carrying the bit. I have a look at the, I know enough about saddle fitting. I can usually find if there's a, a bad sore patch under the saddle or if the saddle doesn't fit. But that, that happens the first day before I even get on them. And then it takes a little while to undo some of that stuff and actually find the real horse underneath it. But yeah, once again, I'm wobbling on, but listen to your horse. That's my advice. Okay. Okay. John, how can people contact you? Um, a lot of people find me on Facebook, mm-hmm. which is easy, but my... Is that just mobile, Facebook, John, John Toomey? Yeah, just yeah. John Toomey on Facebook, yeah. and I get a lot of inquiry on Messenger. My cell phone or my mobile is the best one, which is 0438 603 947. And if you prefer email, it's just john at team Toomey, and the surname's T-W-O, like the number two, M. EY.com. Okay, and we'll have a page for you as well, John. So it'll be on horsechats.com slash John Toomey for those that have missed the email and the phone number. Super. All right, brilliant catching up with you again today. It's um, been really good and hopefully we'll talk again soon sometime. I look forward to it, Glenna. <laughs> Thanks, John. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Oh, wait, before you go, If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now, have a look, horsechats.com. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below. 